Welcome to the Wonder Learn Podcast. I'm your host, Francis Tapon, and in this episode, we are going to be interviewing Joanna Negler, who wrote How to Be an Artist Without Losing Your Mind, Your Shirt, or Your Creative Compass. Fantastic. It is a practical guide, and it is a fantastic book for those who are considering becoming an artist. So, Joanna, how do people determine whether they have the artist call? Because a lot of people, when they have the call to be an artist, they immediately deny it, repress it. I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. I don't, I will never make any money. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got three children, exactly. blah, blah, blah. So tell us a little bit about answering the call and how do you answer it? Well, first to unwind that question, we really need to take care of a myth that we have in our society. And the myth is that if we're creative, we either have to starve and struggle to be a real artist or we have to be a mega instant success multimillionaire. Mm -hmm. Most th those two extremes are like in the 0.001% of the bell curve. Most of us who are creating have families, we have jobs, we have responsibilities, we have duties. And so what I'm saying in the book is that we have to learn to do two things at once. We have to learn to have a healthy life and be an artist at the same time. So to answer your question specifically, how do you know if you're called to do something? And I say, you get pregnant with it. It bugs you. I mean, I'll give you an example from my own life. For three years, I sang for years and years and years in choirs and toured and did things related to singing, but I'd never played the guitar. And I always, I wrote poetry and I always kind of wanted to song write, but I, just, and it was just nagging at me, nagging, nagging, nagging. And finally, I got myself a guitar teacher, I learned about 20 chords, and all this music started pouring out of me. So the idea that something is pushing at you, you're pregnant with it, it won't leave you alone. I also think that we get agitated when we don't do our art. We get unhappy with the state of the world, we get unhappy with our relationships, we get unhappy with our jobs, because somehow we feel like we're not really doing what we came here to do on planet Earth. And when we connect with that stuff that, that we really want to lay out, we want to express it, we want to leave it on the field. When we do that, we start to feel more equanimity. And it doesn't mean that because we do that, we're instantly going to be successful at that process of whatever we're engaging in writing, dancing, singing, painting, whatever it is. We don't know what the outcomes are going to be. But what I'm saying in the book is that in order to find equilibrium, if we're creative, we have to get our hands in our art. There's, there's a term that you use called healthy artists. What do you mean by a healthy artist? It's an extension of what I was just saying, is that when we have this concept that we have to trash our life in order to be an artist, that we need to starve and struggle, that's the, the motif that we were all raised with, that if we're really creative, we will tank our life in order to do this thing. Mm -hmm. And that's fine if you're 19 and you have no responsibilities and you're living with five roommates and you know, you're working at the coffee bar and you know, trying to write your screenplay. But by the time we get into our middle 20s and we've got responsibilities and relationships and we're suiting up and showing up for more than just a career, where we'll want a whole life, that model doesn't work anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to throw out those concepts of either I have to be an instant multimillionaire success or I have to tank my life. It's not gonna work. So what I say in the book is we have to learn how to do two things simultaneously. We have to learn how to have a healthy life. That means take vacations, manage our money, have healthy relationships, support ourselves at some kind of job if our art is not supporting us yet, and do our art at the same time. The analogy I use in the book is, I remember when I was on my way to acting class and I, stopped, I was driving by a tennis court right over here, and I thought to myself, huh, I'm not gonna be taking tennis lessons on Thursday night. I have another thrust in my life. So where other people are gonna to go to their job and have all this recreation time after their job, I'm not gonna have that, because I have a whole other job, if you will. And so that gave me pause for a minute. I was like, oh my God, what am I suiting up for? But then on the flip side, I realized I was never gonna be bored. I was always gonna be engaged. I was always going to feel like I was contributing something meaningful to the world that was meaningful to me, and I wasn't going to retire from it. It's not like but when I turn 65, my creativity is going to go click, 
and it's going to turn off and I'm going to have to find something to do. It's always at work in me. So I call that a blessing for those of us who are called to be creative. The universe, the voice of being alive is very alive in us. Or as my husband likes to say, our job as artists is to mirror back to the world what it is to be alive in our time. What is it to have feelings, emotions, um, experiences, discoveries? What does that look like? What does it feel like? What does it taste like? What's the sensibility of that? Because that's what art really is. It mirrors back to other human beings who might be marketing directors or nurses or dentists what this experience of beauty and love and challenge and struggle is. You know, it's interesting about the mirror. Sometimes I struggle with that as far as trying to find out. I think the answer is that it's a little bit of both as far as whether art imitates life or life imitates art. You know, it's, it's, it's a bit like, for example, in the, in the 50s, you know, I think, you know, you watch movies from the 50s or even the 40s, I think people more or less behaved like you see Humphrey Bogart behaving with and how they treated women and how women behaved and how you say, how do you do, ma'am? And I think that's really how they actually behave. In that sense, art was imitating life. But at other times, it's at the forefront. In other words, a lot of the acceptance of, of gays, of, um, it came first from the art industry, for example. Yeah. In other words, or accepting of minorities, of blacks, of being less racist. That started in Hollywood, where you'd start seeing films like Guess Who's Coming to Dinner with Cindy Poitier that was on the forefront and the society wasn't there yet. But in that sense, the art actually led and society imitated art. What do you think? I think very much so, especially where gay rights are concerned and the acceptability of gay life and our culture that we're seeing happen right now in our time. I mean, from the time I was born till now, revolutionary change. And I think art largely made that happen. I think mirroring back that, that um, here's just another person with another choice, with another experience, or with another predisposition. I won't even say choice. I'll say another predisposition, and here's how we live together with that. Mm -hmm. Right? So I think that's a very powerful medium. Um, I have a very funny story about does life imitate art or art imitate life. When I lived in LA, I went to see Cynthia Ozick speak, who is a, a short story and fiction writer. And she was asked that question, and she said, life interrupts art. She said, I'll give you a good example. I was writing my book. I went into the kitchen. I didn't know that the, that the electricity had gone off in the kitchen. The freezer had melted and I slipped and broke my arm and I couldn't write. Right? <laughs> you know? And so I kind of ascribe to that thought process that life interrupts art and that if we really need this, if we need this for our equanimity and our well-being in the world to feel connected to who we are and what we do in the world, regardless of all the other things we're doing, if we need this expression, mm. then we have to show up and take it. Mm. Nobody's going to give us the time. Nobody's going to line it out for us. Nobody's going to deal with our procrastination for us. We have to learn those skills. And that's what I'm saying in the book. If this is not a process book like The Artist's Way, where you know we do our morning pages and if we're blocked, we do our mending. This is about how do I make time for what's important to me in a busy life? Well said. Now, speaking about what's important to you, one of the things that you talk about in one of your chapters is about getting a day job. Now, in many cases, obviously, you need a day job because art usually pays shit. Right. But, um, but some people, they might be married to a spouse who makes a lot of money, or they might have their own enough, enough money, or they might be in some other financial situation where they just don't really need a day job. Mm -hmm. Should those people get a day job anyway, those budding artists or people that don't really need it, should they get a job anyway because it enforces a certain level of discipline? Well, that's a really brilliant question because, uh, and I'll tell you a little story about that. When I lived in LA, all my friends were like me. I was a grant writer. We all had other gigs. We all had other jobs and we were musicians and we were producers producing plays or producing musicals or we were writing screenplays or we were all doing these amazing creative things. We were all kind of the same. We were all like, if I only didn't have to have a day job, what could I get accomplished? And then I moved here and I got involved in, in a group of women and four out of the six of us had that situation. They didn't have to work. And I'd say largely that group 
could not motivate them could not motivate themselves to do what they said they wanted to do mm. had plenty of time had plenty of money didn't have to worry about supporting themselves so i say that that those of us who kind of curse our day jobs, like if only I were free right. to do what I want to do, we're not ready to saddle up for that kind of freedom until we learn the skills of getting to our art. And so our day job is this incredible blessing because it will make us saddle up and show up. Then by the time we get to that place where we don't need a day job, we already have the skills of sitting down. It's called beating the room. Right? As a writer, we talk about about beating the room. There are all these distractions in the room. And in order to sit down and do what you say is important to you, to do what's important, not what's urgent. What's urgent is this. Right? Right. Oh. right. Go in and, you know, I, my thing was always scrubbing the bathtub. For some reason, when I was procrastinating, I was scrubbing the bathtub. I don't know why. That was my thing, right? So you had the cleanest bathtub ever. <laughs> when, when I was writing something new, my bathtub was incredibly clean. So it was my tile, you know. <laughs> it was just my procrastination default, right? And now it's the phone. No, no, I don't, I'm not. No, I'm saying for other people. Oh, for other people, yeah. Yeah, not for me necessarily because my day job is teaching yoga and so I have to turn off my phone for large periods of time so I'm not um, I'm not cemented to my phone um, but that thought that you know you're gonna sit down and write and then every six seconds ding 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 I don't think that's a good model I think you want to give yourself and I use the timer right the idea of using the timer I wrote my first book one hour a day four days a week by the timer so, you know 80,000 words, it took me a year, a little over a year and a half, one hour a day, four days a week, by the timer. When the timer was done, I shut the computer down. Because what will happen is, just like what happens when you go to the gym, right? You make this New Year's resolution, you know, I'm gonna go to the gym two hours a day, seven days a week, and then by month two, you're like, or month and a half, you're like, I can't do this, you know? So it's the same thing, if you have a quest of some kind, you're, we're better off with regular small amounts of time in. And it was um, you know, a crazy therapist that I went to when I was really frustrated about whether or not I wanted to write this book or not, who said to me, look, set up your life like school. I'm multiply talented, so I had multiple things I wanted to get my hands in. So do a little of this, a little of that, a little of this over the course of months. And over six months, you'll get a lot done. But if it's in these bursts, these I'm going to wait to be inspired, you know, inspiration shows up when we show up on a regular basis. Plus, there's another piece of this that's really important. If we have stuff that's pushing at us to get out of us, when we don't do it, we tend to be dissatisfied with our life. When we do do it, we calm down. I mean, I just got interviewed by media.com and they, um, in the interviewer asked me a similar question. And I said, you know, if I'm wigging out, freaking out, worried. The one thing that will calm me down is to sit down and write, mm. sit down and paint, work on my music. I mean, whatever's going on up here, I'll go Whoosh! Because I have instantly connected to what I say is meaningful to me in my life. And there's huge power in showing up for that. I really like that. What you said is that inspiration shows up when you show up. Yeah, I mean, it's the old Somerset mom quote, which I use in the book, right? So he's asked, do you write when inspiration strikes? And he said, yes, fortunately, it shows up at 9 a.m. sharp every day, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know? so. well, well said. Um, now, what do you think about Kickstarter and Patreon? These are ways that artists can get either a big sum of money in a short time in the case of Kickstarter more like a trickle in the case of Patreon Patreon gives uh, monthly rewards uh, monthly things uh, you think it might be a trap well I'll give you an example a friend of mine um, just wanted to start an ice cream company recently mm -hmm. and uh, she and her partner got together and they did this Kickstarter thing and Kickstarter when it first came out was this really groovy thing and it was really kind of homey and hokey but now the same things happened to Kickstarter that happened to Facebook when the businesses got involved now people are spending two hundred thousand dollars to promote their product on Kickstarter and it's all professional it's slick and it isn't what it originally was but but that aside I think the trap is really putting the cart before the horse 
we think we start we get ourselves thinking in a Kickstarter mode and then if the forty thousand dollars doesn't come from Kickstarter or the two hundred thousand doesn't come from Kickstarter we're like well you know I'll use my credit cards it's this idea of putting the cart before the horse mm -hmm. you know when I was a grant writer there was this really interesting thing that used to happen let's say somebody had a four hundred thousand dollar budget a grantor or a foundation would never give them more than 25% of their budget because it was too risky. They wouldn't go out and diversify. They wouldn't learn the skills. They would just rely on this one funder, right? And it's kind of the same thing with the Kickstarter mode. It's like, okay, well, if I get this big payout, then I don't really have to develop the chops year after year after year of developing my discipline, my show up every day, my get my hands in it, my learn the arc of my skills. In my opinion, I think it's a bit of a trap for artists to think that I've got to get there faster and more furiously. When keeping your jewelry business in your kitchen for another two years might be the arc that gets you the skills and the chops and the marketing skills that you really need for the long term. So I say don't put the cart before the horse. Don't expect to get bailed out by parents, Kickstarter, or credit cards. Just keep doing it a day at a time because we as artists, we don't know what's going to it's not like going to dental school, right? There's a path paved for you. You want to be a tech guru, you know, you want to invent something. Okay, there's a, you know, there's a whole path paved for you about how to follow that even when it's inventive. In artistry, nobody's waiting for your stuff. You don't know how the world is going to respond to your stuff. I mean, I was shocked that my debt book did so well. You know, that was I never had in my life you know, the need to write a chat book. It came to me from inspiration and friends and sat down and wrote it and realized I had a lot to say. And so that's part of the process too of realizing, okay, when I'm called, I want to obey the call. So a really good example is a couple of years ago, I wrote a play. I had this play rambling around in my head for a couple of years and I finally sat down. I had a great time writing it. I loved it. Took a couple of years and then um, just produced it this summer in a short um, production in at Sonoma Arts Live. It was the thrill of my life to just get to direct it, see it come to life. So I try to practice answering the call with my, with my show up ativeness, right? Like with my willingness to show up, with my discipline, with my motivational skills, knowing that I will be well if I answer the call without being attached to the outcomes. And that's really hard in this outcomes-oriented society. We want a payoff, we want it fast, and we want it now. And the art arc is not like that. It's not the you know dental school going, I'm going to be a dentist, and then I'm going to retire. The artist's life is like this. Up and down, up, up and down. Up and down. There's, you know, there's finishing a project, there's moving on to the next one. Does the old project resurface? Do you need to let it go? I mean, there's constantly that going on. You might want to look into Patreon because I know before this interview we talked we talked uh, about the issue of Patreon just because it's a monthly model. So it's more kind of more you know it's kind of a sustained looking for the long term and so you're you're building art on a monthly basis. You're, it's encouraging you to get patrons who support you over month after month after month after month and then Theoretically, you should also produce deliverables every month after month after month, as opposed to doing Kickstarter one big shebang every 10 right. years or every five years. Yeah, and I support more of that kind of a model where, where because, because we're in this for a lifetime, right. right? When you decide to be an artist, you're in it for a lifetime. Right. And that was really the wake-up call for me is I did not do well in the business world. I did not do well in the nonprofit world. I wasn't invested enough in what was there. I loved people. I loved doing a good job. I'm smart. So there were, that, those were not my issues. I just didn't care enough about the product. I wanted to say something to my fellow human beings about being alive, about beauty, about what it is to be elated in life, connected. That's really what I wanted to do. So until I figured that out, I had some misery along the path, right? And once I figured that out and learned how to live simply and without any debt, then my life changed for the better. What do you mean by making peace with money? Well, we just began that conversation. It's a perfect segue question. Um, one of the things I had to learn to do was just live on less and be okay with it. 
right? Like while my, I remember the day one of my really dear friends called me up and said, I just reached the $200,000 mark in my IRA, right? And I was like, dong, 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 what am I doing with my life? But that- I, I reached the $200 mark. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I got 6,000, woohoo. Um, but I just have to acknowledge that I'm wired differently, right? Some people are really happy with the safe model. And it's not about being safe or risky. It's just, this is how their skills fit into the world. My skills don't fit into the world that way. My skills are about a bigger conversation about being alive and being uh, open to new discoveries. And, and you know, I love the Dostoevsky, the Dostoevsky's quote, beauty will save the world. Right. I mean, I live by that, that there's something that we're bringing forward in music and painting, even in writing. I mean, my books are nonfiction books. They're practical books about how I call them my shortcuts to happiness series. Mm -hmm. You know, the debt free spending plan, obviously a five minute a day approach to living debt free. The new one, naked marriage is shortcuts to intimacy because these are the skills we didn't get taught. But there's an artistry in bringing that forward in a way that's human and open and not an expert talking down to you, but just a person having an experience. And so that's part of what I want to share in the world and the legacy I want to leave. You know, I, I read this great book about older folks, people who are in their 80s and 90s, about how they talk about the past a lot because they want to know they left a legacy that was meaningful. Mm. So I think about that now. Am I contributing? to something that's meaningful. I have a little um, note on my computer that says, if this is the only thing I do with my day today, will I be satisfied with it? Right? Will I be satisfied with my day? If it, and that will get me off screwing around, right? Because I know I'll be happier, more content, nicer to my husband, easier with my friends, if I'm easy in my own soul. Explain what you mean by mapping your art life. Yeah, I use a tool in the book called a time map, and it's really pretty simple. And I kind of stole it from years ago when I was, you know, 19 in Key West. And, you know, I, I used to write my waitress schedule on a napkin. Right? You know, I literally pull out a cocktail napkin. I go, OK, I'm on from six to midnight. I'm on from nine to two a.m., you know, like. And so that's kind of what I'm doing in the book is saying, OK, here's your day job eight to five, here's your commute time, um, you know, what time, you know, here's when you have to do laundry, here's your date night, here's, you know, dropping off your kids. So, so really, like, what set hours do you have and what flexible hours do you have? Now, that doesn't mean that every single flexible hour will get used for art. I really believe in building in buffer zones. So I tell people when I'm coaching them, how, let's say you want to be a writer. How many hours a week do you want to write? The person will say 12 to 15. And I'll say, well, okay, you have three kids. You have a, you know, a full-time job. So I always say, whatever it is you think you can do, cut it by two-thirds. Because everything in life takes three times longer than you think. And a more modest approach, a, a come to regularly, like the four hours a week. I mean, what am I doing that's so important that I can't offer an hour a day, four hours a week? Anne Lamott says this great thing, skip the 10 o'clock news, you're only going to hear about fires in places you never go, you know? So the idea of having smaller chunks of time over a regular period of time will get you to that place where you feel like you're, you're connected and it's in a real way. So to make that practical, I have people lay out their set hours and their flexible hours and to say, okay, if I want four hours a week of writing, I'm gonna put it here, 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 and here, and here's two buffer zones in case everything goes to hell on Tuesday night, right? right? Or I just couldn't sleep the night before and I'm not getting up at six in the morning to write my hour. So I really believe in a practical approach because what will happen over time is you'll start to get the payoff and the payoff is really, oh my God, I did my writing. Wow, and my, you know, my husband teaches creative writing and he's a professor of film and uh, creative writing at our local college. And he says this great thing, if you get up in the morning and you do your writing first thing, you own the rest of the day. Everything else can go to a hell in a handbasket and you've already built the pyramids, right. right? I don't particularly like writing first thing in the morning. Sometimes I do it, sometimes I don't. But now I'm so practiced at it 
that I'll come back after my midday yoga class and I just sit my butt down and I begin, right? That took some years to get that. That didn't happen because I decided it should happen, right? It took me practicing, falling down, falling off the horse, figuring out how to get back up. Maybe it's morning, maybe it's night, maybe it's on my lunch hour, right? But slowly but surely, I started to trust myself that as I showed up, there is no such thing as writer's block in my world. Mm -hmm. If I sit down, it's there. And that's because I was willing to show up and show up and show up and show up. Right? It's not because I have s some special powers. Right. It's just because I walked the walk and practiced. Well said. I've always said that you know, writing and being an artist is a job. <laughs> and, that, and a lot of times uh, artists or people who want to be an artist think it's different than being a plumber. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> That's actually a good analogy because, you know, I'm in a writer's group and many of us took this class at Stanford and so now there's about five of us and we get together and we're all trip. Everybody's a really good writer in this group and we review each other's work and it's just really supportive. But one of the members said the other day, you know, I just don't know. Writing is so hard. And I said, yeah, everybody who's ever sat down to invent something on a blank page will tell you it's excruciating. But it's one of the most pleasurable things in the world to see the blank canvas turn into something beautiful, to see the empty page turn into a book, for God's sake. I mean, you know, that's like a miracle. And, you know, to hear yourself sing after rehearsing and not even your own music, but somebody else's and have it come out beautiful and have it move people. You know, whatever those things are that we can do that where we move people, that's a huge gift. I, my, one of my best friends is a musical theater actress, my best friend. And, she, you know, one of the things I said to her early on is, what higher calling could you have than standing in front of a bunch of people and you think about what the arc of that is? There's a couple of people, they're trying to get together on one level or another, they're trying to accomplish something, they fall down, they have obstacles, they learn how to push through the obstacles, and then ta-da, they find their way, right? And so when we think about what we're mirroring back to people, no matter what the form, even if it's dark, it's a beautiful thing to be able to inspire other people to examine their humanity and examine what it is to be alive and connect to it while this other stuff is rushing by. How can people find out more about you and your books? Um, my website, anartistrylife.com. So it's A-N, it's like a sentence, A-N and artistrylife.com and there's all kinds of information and blogs and links to everything that I do travel articles music books this book is a great book for those of you who are considering being an artist and have been denying it or even if you are an artist and you want to be Joanna Negler uh, how to be an artist without losing your mind your shirt or your creative compass a creative a practical guide thank you so much for your time it's a pleasure to be here thanks for having me